Bright lights and no country music, damn. <laughs> you might be able to tell from my saying that, that I do not have Made in St. Louis on the bottom of my feet. So, let me tell you about my St. Louis journey. Pure, unadulterated awesomeness, pleasure, in th oh my God. It is January 1965. I am 19 years old and I am right down in the middle of downtown St. Louis. Oh my God, the buildings are so tall. I am gazing at them in awe. Actually, I'm gawking. I know that. And people are passing me by, men in three-piece suits and shiny shoes, women in dresses and coats and hats to match. And nowhere, absolutely nowhere for hundreds of miles are cotton fields to be worked, are rice or beans. And if God is good, maybe I will never have to pick cotton again. I am in love with this city. The hustle, the bustle, all the people. I am going to live here. I'm going to find a job. I'm going to find an apartment. And life will be good. I will bring my children up from Arkansas. A month goes by. And you know what? I'm 19, and I get a cold water flat, third floor walk up on North 19th, right past Hyde Park. Get a job in a factory, bring my daughters age five months and two and a half years up here. Life is perfect. I am my own boss. I am a woman fully grown. No one can tell me what to do or criticize me. No one can tell me how to raise my children. There is just one small nagging problem, and it is the colored. I ride the bus, and do you believe this? African-American colored people sit next to me. Totally unacceptable. I was not raised that way. So I do what only I can do based on my raisin. I stand up, going back and forth and back and forth, and I begin to wonder how long can I live here up north in Yankee land? Can I do this 40 years standing back and forth and back and forth? Or do I have to go back home again and pick cotton? A few months later, in the summer, the dilemma was solved. I went home for a long weekend, and my mother sent me on an errand across town. It was beginning to get slightly dark as I'm coming back. The sun was at that beautiful stage where it's kind of pink and all of that. And because it was hot and humid, the mimosas and the magnolias smelled so delicious and sweet. And I decided to take a shortcut through Colored Town. And as I'm going around a bend, there in front of me is a toddler playing in the front yard. And the toddler's mom is sitting on the steps watching. And I'm just noticing it and walking. And suddenly the toddler falls. When the toddler gets up, the knees are skinned and the toddler is bellowing. And mom comes running. And she picks that toddler up. And she holds that baby close to her heart. And she pats. 
And I thought, oh my God, she is just like me. When my daughter falls and skins her knees, that's exactly what I do. We are both human. We are one. We are alike. Who sat by me from then on mattered not at all. A few years later, I went to nursing school. And when I got out of nursing school, like many new nurses, you get the midnight shift. Yeah, you do. And if you're thinking about nursing, you also have to work weekends and holidays. <laughs> so anyway, I get a job at Lutheran Hospital down on South Jefferson. My first boss was a large African-American woman who took no guff, but took me under her wings and showed me the rope. One night, oh, probably about five in the morning, she came to us and she said, so-and-so is having a birthday. Let's celebrate that birthday. We will all go to Uncle Bill's on South Kings Highway. <laughs> yes, we did. The whole integrated, motley, sleep-deprived crew of us. We walked into Uncle Bill's. We commandeered a table right smack in the middle of the restaurant. <sighs> Jaws dropped open, napkins fell, silverware clanked. Curses were said under people's breaths and fingers were raised. We sat there and we ate and we talked. And inside my head, I am scared and superior. I can do both of those really well. <laughs> the scared part of me is, growing up where I was, if you were white and you hung out with African Americans, that was also a good way to get killed. So I'm wondering if, oh my god, can I make it to my car in the parking lot? And then the other part of me, the self-righteous Marilyn Sue. I have black friends. I am so cool. I'm not like them. I obviously made it through the parking lot, made it so that I could campaign for Barack Obama. Got to vote for him. Never thought I would live long enough to be able to vote for an African-American. Got to do it not just once, but twice. So obviously, we are post-racial, right? <laughs> we have done that, been there, and I've got the Obama t-shirt to prove it. <laughs> 2013, his fabulous speech. My favorite lines were Second of Falls, Selma, and Stonewall. It was such a powerful one that I wrote a story about the campaign, about my own racism, about my journey. And I love the way that inauguration ended because at the end of the inauguration, at the parade, the thing that caused tears to come to my eyes was the diverse marching band from Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. My home state saluting our first African-American president. So I wrote the story. And I ended the story with a place called Hope. A couple of years later, I was invited to tell the story in Chicago. So as I'm, going, as I'm coming out of the ballroom, I told the story, A Place Called Hope, because Chicago is the hometown of the president and first lady. As I come out of the hotel, I notice on the television screen, the, it is on silent, but I notice a yellow tarp on a street. And I remember that it had been there when I went into the ballroom. 
And as I go off to bed, I'm thinking, oh my God, what kind of atrocities is ISIS up to now? The next morning, of course, I found out that the body was that of Michael Brown. And it had lain in his street for hours. My illusion was shattered. We are not post-racial. Race is still ever present in our lives. Because I have white privilege, I don't always see it. But I began to see it. And all fall, I'm a nurse. My patients, many of them live in Ferguson. And I would go back and forth to Ferguson weekly, sometimes more often than that. And I would hear and see protesters. And what is my peace? What do I need to do differently? And then one of the things that gave me a piece of hope in all of this despair was in 2014, the Cards won the pennant. I was in Ferguson the night they won the pennant. And let me tell you, this is what I heard. Hands up, don't shoot, go cards, go. Hands up, don't shoot, go cards, go. And I had my dream. My dream is that all of us, we live in Cardinal Nation. And if we work together, we can create a climate where each and every one of us gets a turn at bat, and can aim for home. Thank you very much.